Good afternoon, everybody. This is CAC UK, Class Action COVID UK. This is our Freedom Friday call. Uh, we do this on the first three Fridays of the month. And today is the third Friday of the month. And so we are going to do our legal surgery. And this is where we discuss how, uh, your legal rights. Uh, this session is set up um, to help you to know and assert your rights, because it's one thing to know your rights, and it's another thing to be able to assert those rights and be able to have somebody accept those rights and uh, carry on, for instance, in your employment if you are struggling with you know, employers mandating uh, vaccines or other medical interventions. We do this on the third Friday every month. This is not legal advice. We're going to be talking about the law loosely. And today, uh, we, as I said, we're talking about medical mandates. We are joined by Edward Lowe, who has set up the National Employers Union, who is helping people struggling with medical mandates and obviously all other employee issues. But that seems to be the main issue at the moment. And Edward, you have also set up the Legal Advice Network, which has been doing some great work around this area as well. So as I stop this share, I am going to invite Edward to speak. And just to give you uh, a bit of a background, um, I reached out to Edward a few months ago um, when we did this call in September. And I've only just managed to, we've only just managed to um, connect with each other in the last few weeks. So we've had quite a lot of discussions. I'm gonna say now that the law is a gray area and the law in COVID is a gray area. And I'm going to say that that's a good thing. So um, that doesn't mean confusion. It means that you can use the law as a tool in a way that suits us. Um, you know, Edward and I have had a lot of discussions. We disagree on some aspects of the law and we agree on others. I think the bottom line with this issue of medical mandates, uh, all the lawyers that I've spoken to seem to agree on one thing, that informed consent is paramount. Nobody in English law can force you or... or require you to undergo any kind of medical intervention without your consent and that consent has got to be free informed it's got to be prior informed so you've got to know the facts before you uh, decide to consent and the facts that you are supposed to have access to have got to be relevant to your situation not to somebody else so informed consent is absolutely paramount how are uh, the UK government and governments around the world manage it and employers managing to get these medical mandates and, and forced vaccinations, forced medical interventions in place, such as testing and masks. Well, uh, you know, we're in unprecedented times, as you know, and this is essentially, I'm just going to say they're sneaking them in. Um, so we have to use the law for ourselves to get across these hurdles. So I'm going to introduce Edward. And Edward, can you start off just by um telling us how you got yourself into this please <laughs> a bit of background behind legal advice network and the union i will thank you first of all thank you for the invite it's a pleasure to be here mina um, because i have been obviously aware of the great work that you're doing and as as mina has said we've had several discussions we don't agree on everything and that's a good thing because it, it always sharpens your mind when, when you come up against um, a, dif a different legal opinion. And ultimately, that can lead to better solutions, better arguments with the law. Me, my background is in the building industry as a plasterer and a tiler. I had, um, I've always been self-employed and always had an interest in the law because you have to know uh, you have to be able to na navigate your, your, your way around the law when you're in business for yourself. So I decided to go to university. Um, in 2017, I got my law degree. In 2018, I got my master's in law. I then taught law for a year at a London university. And in that time, it became apparent to me that if the public want to get legal advice, they've broadly got two options. First, they've got free online advice, Citizens Advice Bureau, etc. And a lot of people, they're able to solve their problems that way. And that's fantastic. Because the law is free, uh, essentially. And you don't have to be a lawyer, a solicitor, a barrister to be able to use the law. If you can find it online, and you can apply the law to your problem, let's say, 
and, and provide the solution, then in essence, that's what the law is about. It's, the law is the rules of the game. It, it, it's simply the guidelines so that we can all get on and, and do the things we want to do without harming anybody else. And obviously, if you do harm somebody along the way, then there'll be a consequence to that, which in civil law is typically some compensation. For the people who can't solve the law, their problems themselves, typically they have to go and see a solicitor. The average London solicitor charges £220 an hour plus. And the result of that is there are over a million civil legal problems a year that cannot be solved simply because people cannot afford to get the legal advice to get justice. So I thought to myself, right, if logically people cannot afford £200 an hour, some will be able to afford £100 an hour. And logically, if some people can afford £200 an hour, they would prefer to pay £100 an hour. So can I set up a legal advisory service based around £100 an hour to be able to provide the public with a greater access to the law, which is a greater access to justice? And I developed a business model that enabled me to do that, and I branded that Legal Advice Network. So Legal Advice Network began to be rolled out um, predominantly on Facebook at the beginning of this year. And I was simply reacting to the problems that people brought to me. And they were mostly to do with COVID related issues. For example, mask discrimination. Um, I had people come to me who were refused surgery because they wouldn't um, have a PCR test. And so I got quite in depth into all of the law around COVID and people's rights. Along the way, I was introduced to um, another union that the Workers of England Union that are standing up for um, the care workers, the care workers at the time. And I devised a strategy for them to get the worker into a meeting, a formal meeting, and then put the law on the table um, and, and with, with, with the aim of, of pushing that law, law up the management tree, ultimately to the CQC, to put pressure on them to try and get some answers from the CQC as to, to, to for, for example, can you please explain how this regulation 12 requirement to vaccinate is not discriminatory? Can you please explain how regulation 12 is able to violate uh, human rights? CQC is the acronym for the Care Quality Commission, and that's the regulatory body for care homes in the UK. Because as I would explain in the meetings, you would imagine that if, if, the regulatory if your regulatory body is telling you to follow this regulation, they'll be able to answer why it's not discriminatory, why it's okay to violate human rights. But if they can't answer that question, then that's going to tell us something else. So I devised this strategy um, to be run through that union. And for whatever reason, it, it, it was made complicated. For me at that time with Legal Advice Network, we had three USPs, unique selling points, that it was low cost, um, that it would be jargon free and a simple process. So I was then associated with a complicated process, whereas I advocate being able to explain the law in a simple manner. So I took a step back from that union. Me being me, and I don't know where ideas come from, but the idea popped in my head to start my own union. Because then I would be able to direct it in the way that I saw fit and to be able to use simple strategies uh, and the law in a simple fashion to be able to look after people's rights. So the union that I have established is the National Employees Union. And it has now been 
live for six, six and a half weeks. And I personally have sat in over 80 meetings with care workers, um, community workers, social care workers, with some of the largest care home providers in the UK, uh, national trusts, uh, local councils and private organisations in, in relation to other matters. So that's where we are. We're, we're at the stage where we, are, um, we, we have a full-time administrative person and we are implementing advanced IT infrastructure to cope with um, growth that, that we can foresee. So we're going to implement that up front so that we can grow with that and learn how to use it properly. We will be engaging um, more staff this week um, for admin and also in uh, paid union official roles so that they can also represent um, members of the National Employees Union in, in meetings. So that's where we are. Thanks, Edward. Thanks for that. Um, Kind of background. Um, so I'm just going to um, I'm going to start off by just asking a, a very basic question. In that, um, what's your what's the first thing that you do when a if somebody comes to you uh, comes to the you let's talk about the union for a start. So if somebody comes to the union and says uh, my employers uh, I'm, I'm threatened to be sacked if I don't get the vaccine, what's the first step? Where, where do you take that? How how do you work with that person? First step is that we send them a booking form. Um, so they'll provide their details, their employer's details, um, a, a, a summary of what's happened to date. And then we will liaise with them and their employer to set up a meeting that okay. they will be represented at. Because every, it's important to know that every employee ha has a legal right to be a member of a trade union. And you can be a member of more than one if you choose. You also have a right to uh, have a grievance meeting if you have a grievance to raise. And you also have a right to be represented in that meeting by a, the union. And the, the union, unions have a very special and powerful position or role that they can play because in a grievance meeting with your em employer, you can't have your solicitor with you. You can't have your barrister with you, but you are legally entitled to have your union with you. And so when your union representative knows the law, in essence, you've, you've, you've got a lawyer with you in, in, in the meeting and the, the employers can't reasonably um, refuse you that right. Okay, so it's kind of an advocacy service because obviously, and what is the law on medical mandates? Just briefly, what is the law on the NHS uh, mandates and the care worker mandates in your view? What's happening there? I mean, how do you... Uh, briefly, so you want me to, you want we, me to answer that briefly? briefly. Yeah. So we've talked about uh, a couple of calls, a couple of months ago, we talked about exemptions and, um, and you've seen the video where I've talked about uh, everybody can essentially... What, my my um the view that i put forward is that everybody in this country in fact everybody in the world really is entitled to a, an exemption and they can self-exempt themselves so so how do we how do we how do we do this you know how do we assert this exemption well i think the starting point you touched on earlier mina and that is that we we have an inalienable inalienable which means it can never be taken away from us. Human right to informed consent. I, de I decide what goes in my body, whether, whether it's a swab up my nose or a paracetamol or, or an injection of any description. That's my choice. And informed consent has two elements. The informed relates to the information about that thing, about that swab or, or about that pill or about that injection. And the information has to be about two things, the benefits and the risks. And I need to be told about both of those before I decide if, whether I want to take, run the risk 
in order to get the benefit. And the key point about the consent is that it has to be free. It has to simply be my decision without any threat, without any coercion, without any encouragement and without any persuasion. And that, that's set out in international law. It's, it springs out of the Nuremberg Code, um, perhaps academically. It's in the Universal Declaration of Bioethics and, and, and Human Rights, which was signed unanimously by all countries in the world in 2005. And, and you know, when, when, when do all the countries of the world ever agree on anything? It's, it's ex expressed in the European Convention of Human Rights um, under Article 8 and the associated case law there. It's driven into the UK through the Human Rights Act. And we've got the Supreme Court decision of Montgomery and Lanarkshire Health Board. But on a practical level, it, it's written into the NHS Constitution and the General Medical Council guidelines. So it's informed consent is, is set in stone. And yet here we have this piece of secondary legislation that seeks to take that free decision away from people by, by saying, well, if you don't have it, you will lose your job. And how can that be a decision that someone makes freely when, for example, I mean, I, I've heard this on more than one occasion. A member has come to me and said, if I lose my job, I, I will be a single parent on the street. How is that a decision? How is that not a threat to that person? Mm. Exactly. It's, yeah, if it's, yeah, if it's a conditional, if it's a condition of employment, um, then it is a mandate, isn't it? I've exactly. got a few questions coming up in the chat. So can I run through these questions? And I think that'll probably be sure. a, a good way of doing it. Cause I was going to sort of open yeah. it up, but there's so many people on the call. I think we've got about hundred, we've got the maximum hundred people on the call now. So um, if you do have a question for Edward, uh, pop it into the chat and then I'll read it out rather than sort of like, you know, kind of yeah. with the hands up thing. So the first question is, do you work with people from Scotland too? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Um, next question. Um, do you only help with employment matters? I mean, outside the remit of a trade union. The National Employees Union sticks to employment law. Um, obviously, I have the Legal Advice Network. The Legal Advice Net Network does not do employment law because there needs to be a bright line between the two entities. Um, so for other legal matters, Legal Advice Network can help. But in time, one, one, one of the benefits to our members is that we want to be able to provide legal advice on matters other than employment, because obviously, you know, people can have all sorts of legal issues that arise at, at any time. Um, we don't have that in place at the moment, but it, it, a month or two or three and, and, and we will have that up and running. Yeah, and I think it goes without saying that if you're on this call and, you, um, and you're and you looking for something to do uh, to join the fight, um, get in touch with Edward because I think you, it would be, you know, the more hands on deck, the better, right? Um, you oh, abso do, absolutely. You are recruiting reps. so we, we are recruiting. If anybody is interested in an administrative role or uh, as being a union rep, um, whether you, the, the first rec prerequisite for that is that you've got the desire. Um, we, we have a training program in place. I've taught law. I enjoy teaching um, and, and that will be an ongoing um, program. So, yeah, absolutely. Email us info at n-e-u.co.uk um, and, and, and we can talk. All right. I'm right, typing that into the chat. So it's info at n-e-u.co.uk. Yeah. So yep. I've typed that into the chat if anybody wants to copy that in. So uh, the next question here is, uh, I'm just scrolling up because I'm going to try and do them in turn uh, in order. So we've got, um, do you provide any support for self-employed people who 
uh, interface with civil service, e.g. the courts. So I think the, the answer to that would be obviously that advice would come from the Legal Advice Network, right? If it's somebody else, uh, self-employed people, or does that come under the, the union? No, the self, well? self, self-employed, self-employed can join the union. The key to it all is is to understand that the the statutory purpose of a union is to regulate workplace relations. So, you know, we don't enter meetings in an adversarial capacity. It's it's a roundtable discussion. But the, the value the union can add in, is, is, is in relation to the law. Um, and, and so we're solution orientated and we're simply find, trying to find ways through that can facilitate the, both the employee and the employer being able to work together. So the, the, the first step, whether you're employed, whether you're self-employed, is, is to have, just to have a meeting and, and, and discuss it really. So the self-employed person could arrange to have a meeting with the relevant person, simply ask for the union to be there. And, and we, we, we have the discussion. We look at the problem and we try and find a route through. OK, so I've got so let me just follow up from that, because I've got a few friends who are self-employed or freelance, let's say, um, actors and actresses or let's say filmmakers. And they're used to sort of flying overseas um, and, you know, get, getting commissioned to do jobs and all of a sudden those jobs are now um, dependent on them being vaccinated and so they're not in the picture, they're not in the running for these jobs anymore. So what would you do to some, what, would, what can you do with somebody in that situation or can you help somebody in that situation? It becomes very difficult when we think about travelling to a different country because we we there's, there's three barriers. We've got what, whatever you know restrictions are imp imposed in this country. We we can deal with those. The airlines are the second um, problem, really, because they seem to be a, a law unto themselves. And and then you've got the laws of the country that you want to get into, and we we've got no authority over that. So even if we were able to tackle the problem domestically and with the airlines, the, the airlines are caught between a rock and a hard place because they're a commercial enterprise. And, and if, for example, the United States was saying, well, you know, we're not going to let your passengers off and, unless they're, they're all fully vaccinated, what, what's the airline to do? And it's perhaps what the big airlines would have some weight with their with their regulatory body but nobody's taken the airlines to court because it takes money not yet yeah and, and, so, and, and, and so that's just, that, that yeah. see that that's 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 one of the a, a higher level aim of, of the neu if, if you imagine the big unions they've got over a million members now if each of those members was paying for example 15 pounds a month that's 15 million pounds a month in, in membership fees that they're taking, right? That's that's plenty of money to mount legal challenges on behalf of their workers or their, their members, but they're not doing it. None of, none of them are doing it. All of the unions, bar Workers of England Union and NEU have bowed out of this. Members are coming to us and they're saying, I've spoken to Unison, I've spoken to Unite, I've spoken to GMB, and they've, they've said, they're encouraging us to have the vaccination. They'll support us once we've been dismissed, but they won't support us now. Mm. So if we can get our membership base up, if, if any of you had only 10,000 members times 15, that's 150,000 pounds a month. Now, you would probably have to um, hive off at least half of that for administering it but you're still left with 75,000 pounds a month, which is a lot of money to enable you to get matters into court. And that's, that's where this is going to be won. It's going to be won in court. And the issues are so complex uh, or so gray, as Mina said earlier, that there are, there, there are many different avenues in to try and stop uh, the, these, these medical mandates. And 
it, money simply gives us the flexibility to be able to tick them off one by one. You know, a failure in court on one day doesn't mean that, you know, you're not going to have a success the next. Yep. And I, I tend to agree as well. I've heard uh, many lawyers recently saying this isn't going to be one in the courts and the, and the justice system is broken. Um, I have a slightly different view because, and I've written about it recently as well, in that um, my view is that types of cases that have been brought are not the types of the correct types of cases and the arguments that have been put forward have not been good enough. Sure. And so that's a strong uh criticism but you know we're all entitled to our view and we have a case as i said that we're working on class action code uk it's not yeah. come to the courts yet it's a huge case it's a phenomenally huge case so um but i have faith in it and i know that lots and lots of others have faith in it as well and by the way there are others who share my view about um about the judicial reviews as well so i've got i'm just running through this question oh, oh, mina on that on that point i think it's really important that um Oh, I've lost my train of thought now. It, it, we were talking about the courts. Yes. Um, okay, the justice system is broken, right? Now, you, you, you could point to reasons why that is so, but what choice have we got? Do we just throw our hands up in the air and say the justice system is broken, so we just won't try? If we do that, mm. then this juggernaut is, is, is going to run Thank us all you. over, yep. right? So we have to try. Until we have tried, we, we won't actually know. And if we can stick a, 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 a stick in the spoke of the wheels of this, whatever it is that's coming upon us, at, at least we will know we have tried. Exactly. So and, sorry. You know, what, 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 whatever comes after that, you, you need to be able to justify it on, on the fact that the justice system is broken. So either way, mm. we have to get these matters into court. Mm. NEU is funding a le legal action. I, I can't tell you when it is because I don't want to flag it up, but it is very soon. We are funding a matter that will be before a court very soon. And we will obviously be, be working with MENA and, and helping MENA however we can with, with CAC UK to get these matters into court in front of judges with, with such clear persuasive arguments that the, the bench of judges is left with no other um, reasonable route than to decide in our favour. Yeah. I've got a, uh, moving on, I've got another question. And uh, somebody's asked uh, a general question, how are hospitals getting away with saying, unless you have a PCR test, they will not operate on you or treat you. Um, Edward, we had a conversation about this uh, a little while, uh, about a week ago, and um, I think you can help people in that situation through the Legal Advice Network, is that right? In yes, terms of getting out of a PCR test? Absolutely, and the short point is that the, the NHS constitution places a duty on, on the NHS and the people that work in it to not refuse medical care unreasonably. A PCR test is medical treatment, albeit for the purpose of di diagnosis. So if you're offered medical treatment, PCR test, and you decline it because you have the right of informed consent, it's then unreasonable for you to be refused medical care on the, just because you've exercised your rights. For you to be refused care, if you're caused any harm as a result of that, which likely you will be because you need some care to fix you up, and, and, and perhaps the, the anxiety associated with, with not being fixed up, then that, that's negligent uh, and, and you'll be due compensation. So, you know, the template letter that I've devised is, is 10 pages long. And the bottom line is you're in breach of the, consti of, of the NHS constitution, which means that if you persist, there will be a, a, a claim for compensation. Let's not go down that route. Instead, just exercise, um, you know, follow, follow the law, follow the constitution and, and rebook this person for, for their surgery or, or whatever care it might be without having the test. And that I've, I've written letters for people. 
to that effect and they've been successful. Good. Okay, so I've got another question here. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here that I'm going to read together because I know you've kind of covered uh, them anyway. So just it's just a recap, really. So a student nurse has been told if they don't get the vaccine, they can't continue with the training or the course. What advice can you give? And then the other question is, do I wait to be employed? Uh, do I wait to be approached by my NHS employer? And is there a parliamentary debate in December on this mandate? So a uh, couple of questions there. So one about the training and one about do I wait to be uh, approached by the employer? OK, for the NHS staff, students, all we have at the moment is an announcement that come the 1st of April, staff need to be doubly vaccinated or triply vaccinated, whatever it is at that time. But it's only an announcement. So there's actually nothing that the NHS can do. So. If, if you're being pressured to, because we need your vaccination status, um, we need to know that you will be having the vaccine, there's absolutely no grounds for them to be asking you that. Now, if you think about it from the other side of the coin, NHS trusts are large organisations and they need to formulate policies well in advance, and that's fine. They they can well expect that legislation will be drafted and, and, and they can anticipate the, the, the detail on that and they can draft policies. But those policies need to stay on the desks or in the offices of the policy makers. Once they bring those policies onto, onto the wards and start imposing them on the staff, they've overstepped the law because there is no law that supports that policy that requires you to give up your, your, medical, um, your medical record as to whether you're vaccinated or not, or to have you to agree that you're going to be having the vaccination at some point. Um, and that is the key point for NHS staff and students at the moment, that if you're feeling any pressure, then let's get into a meeting. Let's, all you have to do is very softly send an email, to, to, to your, your line manager and say, can we have a meeting about the vaccination? And I'd like my union representative to be there to support me. That's all you have to do, okay? Because the key point is that when you have a meeting about any aspect of your contract of employment or anything that's um, important about your role, it's a formal meeting. You can call, you can call it a coffee and biscuits morning but if it's about your employment contract, it's a formal meeting. And that means there'll be minutes taken. We can ask for things to be done because you know, we're negotiating and we, we, we can take that the other side to that point that they say, oh yes, we'll look into that. And then that has to be actioned on and it can be followed up. So NHS staff, students, if you're being pressured, if you're not being pressured and you, you would like to, you know, enter into this strategy, just ask for a meeting and to be supported by your union rep. Because if you imagine, for each of us, it's, it's just me, I'm just one. But with 100,000 staff potentially going to um, be fa facing dismissal, let's say, on the 1st of April, if we could get 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people into these meetings, and we, we can push the law up the management line, we can get them to have a look at the law right now um, as to what they should be doing, performing risk assessments, seeing if they've got insurance policies in place. And if they look at those right now, either way, they, it will become apparent to them that they cannot ask their staff to be vaccinated. And we need to get into their heads up front now because they cannot come back with the, the, the retort that all the care home managers came back with, which was, we're just following regulation 12. We're just following regulation 12. The NHS right now cannot say that. They've got no law to say that they're following. So they have to follow the law in relation to risk assessments, for example, okay? So that, that's, that's the way we're approaching it. Yeah, I think that's really clear. And, and the essence is that obviously when you start conversations on a friendly note, you're much like much more likely to get a positive effect. Um, you know, I, I've kind of covered this in a previous um, video as well, in the sense that there's there's 
there's a kind of five step process almost and you start off with an informal conversation and you, you have that you proactively take charge of that situation is what you're saying Edward I think so you're the person is the employee is taking charge of the situation by pro being proactive in asking for the meeting before you know they're being pushed against a wall and Absolutely. you know kind of threatened almost yeah um I okay so I've got I've got another question here and somebody has asked and I, and I know with this group uh, and we've covered this a few times about common law so I know that there are uh, and you're probably aware there are lots and lots of people now and there's a big movement to, for um, the general public to get on top of what we're calling common law and what some people are calling common law isn't what other people call common law so it's it's a kind of a, a phrase that's bandied around and somebody has asked a question can we differentiate between natural brackets, common law and statute? And I'm just gonna get ahead of that before throwing it over to you, Edward, in, in the sense that um, natural law and common law are actually two different things. And I know there is there are groups that are calling them the same thing, but actually natural law is not common law and common law is not natural law. So you can define common law how you want, but common law as defined by law it means a certain thing and it means the law that the type of legal framework that we have in this country which is based on not only statute but also case law and decisions made in the courts and decisions made in the courts evolve as time goes on because you might have a new case in five years time which is similar to a case you had today but the nuance is slightly different and it has to be led in a different way and judges have discretion in certain cases and they can put forth uh, certain judgments which then in a sense create new laws and that's how the law evolves so Edward mentioned Montgomery and um, Lanarkshire earlier on and this is the kind of standout case in common law in case law which underpins exactly what informed consent means to the finest detail in this country so that's common law Whereas natural law, I think when you say natural law, you're really talking about, um, you know, religion or philosophy or, you know, um, you know, the, the inalienable rights, that kind of thing, which are not defined, which just you, you're just born with. So, you know, and statute, I would say, you know, statute is obviously written legislation. And I think that forms part of common law. But, you know, even among lawyers, there's a little there's a little bit of a discrepancy in what how we define these things so Edward what would you say in terms of what's the difference between natural law common law statute I think what I'll say is what you've said in a, in a different way there's there's three there's there's three different aspects to the term common law in the UK we're in a common law jurisdiction and and that like Mina has said that means we've got um, we've got acts of parliament and, and we've got case law and it's the, it's basically about how the system is run as opposed to in in europe they have a, a civil law jurisdiction so the law is simply run in a different way um, we've also common law is also referred it, 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 it's the cases it's another word for case law so we've got a common law jurisdiction we've got case law and, and then we've got the, the groups that talk about common law. And I call it common law theory because the essence of what they say is do no harm. And really what they're talking about at that point is, is natural law theory, like, like Mina has said. Um, and the, 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 what I struggle with, with the, with the common law theorists is that a lot of what they say is right, but there's a lot of confusion in the groups as well uh, as to how they can actually use it in a practical way, because if you go into a courtroom in the UK and you st start talking about theory and philosophy, it, it, it's not going to it, it's not going to help your cause. When you go into a courtroom in the UK, you need to give reference to acts of parliament or reg regulations and previously decided cases, case law. Typically, act, acts, acts of parliament are quite broad. So they'll, they'll govern a, a particular type of behavior. But 
and, and, and the cases are, are where are about specific behavior. It's, it's specific to the claimant and the defendant in, in that case. And sometimes the, the decisions that they well, the decisions will only be relevant to other cases where, where the facts are the same as in that case. So acts of parliament abroad, if you think about it that way, and case law is is specific and it may or may not apply to you you may or may, may not be able to use that case to to advance your argument common law the common law theorists don't really come into it in court and that that troubles me because it sounds really simple common law theory and 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 that's attractive because the law if if, if the law can seem very complicated and, and people tend to gravitate towards what is simple. But by a large swathe of people gravitating to something that is simple, that it, they're, they're basically taking all those people away from the courts because they're not going to be able to use that common law theory in the courts. And actually what we need is people understanding their rights, like Mina said at the beginning, people asserting their rights and where necessary, asserting their rights in the courts. Because the more of us that get into court with our problem, the more judges are gonna to have to look at these, these COVID measures. And at some point, even if it's a war of attrition, we will get the decision in our favor. And once we get a decision in our favor, because these laws are blanket across us all, it won't be specific just to that one person, but it will affect us all. Does that make sense? It does. It does to me. Yeah, I think you've. Um, I think you've covered that really well. I can't speak for everybody else, but I know because of uh, you know time and stuff. I, I I will just say thank you uh, to that. Uh, and hopefully um, that will have satisfied whoever asked, asked the question. I've got another, I'm um, to do another couple of questions quickly before moving on. So I've got a question for Edward. Uh, Edward, with things seeming to get worse in Austria and the latest announcement from them this morning, uh, which I haven't heard, so apparently their chancellor has apparently announced that Austria will be the first country to make jabs mandatory by law, and uh, Edward, what is your take on this? In, so this kind of follows on for the last question. What's your take on this in relation to inalienable, I can't even say, in, inalienable rights? Uh, as far as I comprehend it, says the, the person who's asking the question, mandatory is not law, according to Black's Law Dictionary. And could this happen in the UK? So I'm just gonna sum up that because I don't know, uh, Edward, whether you've come across this, but there have been quite a few shares recently of uh, a meme or, or a little video showing that the word showing the word mandatory in Black's legal dictionary. Um, uh, you know, and I have my view on on these kind of um, these little shares. Um, but yeah, just in, in terms of that, can you can you answer to that question? So, what's your take on this? Uh, Austria will be the first country to make the jabs mandatory by law. Uh, and so how does that affect us in the UK? And in relation to our inalienable rights, mandatory is not law, according to Black's Law Dictionary. OK, let me tackle mandatory first. Man mandatory has got several um, def definitions and, and they're all relevant. It has to be in context. Um, if an act of parliament says that you must do something it's it's mandatory okay so it's 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 an act of parliament that says you must do something so it's mandatory if that act said that you may do something it's not mandatory it's discretionary it's up to you you may you may or may not right if we go back to the saying an act of parliament saying you must do something so it's mandatory there are typically also exceptions to those mandatory rules, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean that 
in essence, it's not a mandatory rule. It's mandatory unless there's an, exempt, an exemption to it. So a company policy almost or, or also might say it's mandatory in this company that you wear shoe protectors, okay? Because we, we're dealing with sensitive equipment, okay? And, and again, it's you must wear it, so it's it's mandatory. But for 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 the, that company, it's not law, but it's a mandatory requirement because you must do it. So you can see in in different contexts, mandatory means a separate thing. In relation to the the Black, Blackstone's dictionary, Black's Law Dictionary. Mm. Black's Law dictionary if, if you're if you're trying to solve a legal problem, the, the first the first step is to go to Acts of Parliament and, and see what the acts say about that problem, about that behavior. How, how does how does the act guide that behavior? Secondly, you'll you'll go to cases and see if the principle that comes out of that case can solve your problem. Thirdly, if you get down into the nitty gritty of terms, you use the plain language, just plain English language to see if it solves it. And at that point, you might even go to the dictionary or that, that, word, that word might be defined in another case. So it's a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle that lawyers have to put together. And you might use the Oxford Dictionary to say, okay, well, what, what, what's the definition of an organization? Okay, well, it's it's a club or a group. Okay, well, that, that might give us a bit more context. And you've also got legal di dictionaries that you can fall, fall back on as well. But legal dictionaries are only of any use in, in relation to a specific term in context. So to go to a dictionary and then quote that as law is, is, is just misguided. Yep, okay, thanks. This is I'm misguided. Gonna... In, in relation to Austria, um, you have a human right to inform consent. So the Austrian government saying, we're gonna mandate it, we're gonna make it a proper act of Austrian law. That law in itself, yes, it, yes, yes, it's an act of parliament. Yes, it's law, but it's a bad law. It's, it's a morally corrupt law. So there's a lot of argument that says that 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 law in itself is unlawful um, and the third point to make on that is that it's tyranny it's pure mm. and simple medical tyranny mm. absolutely and i think everybody here would agree as well um, i'm just going to go uh, and also, it's important to note as well that Austria is a different, I, I don't know what the legal system is in Austria, but I suspect that that's, that's a civil law country as opposed to a common law country. In civil law countries, France, Germany, you know, many parts of Europe, um, their laws are a, a lot more black and white, as I understand. Um, yeah. But you've also got to see that if you're in Austria, you, you would need to see the legality, the lawfulness of such a mandate against existing laws or, or international treaties that Austria is a part of. So if Austria is a part of, is a party to, let's say, uh, the bioethics declaration, then this law, the mandatory jabs would go against that. So, so that's, I mean, that's Austria's issue um, to deal with. Um, and in, in our country, I think we have possibly more rights because of the common law and the, the as you said earlier, the informed consent being set in stone in our country. Um, yeah. By the way, the, what you said about shoe protectors. So, okay, so let's let's say, just, just to kind of frame that, let's say a company says it's mandatory for you to wear shoe protectors, right? Now, if that is a building company, then obviously the reason for the mandate is because it's, it's to do with, it's for your health and safety. Now, let's take another scenario. Um, my company says it's mandatory for you to have a vaccination, right? They might say it's for health and safety of the other workers, but if that vaccination is dangerous and useless, then, and I'm saying if, then that would go against health and safety. So then you can take that company to court for breach of their health and safety 
duty of care to you as an employee. All right. So, so it's, it's not it's so mandatory, you know, you've got to take it in context, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I'm going to have one final question. I didn't realize the time actually, this is two minutes too. So I'm going to wrap up with one question and then I'm going to sort of close this. Um, and uh, we'll, now, we'll now end the call because we normally end at one. So the last question I'm going to ask of you is, let's roll up because I know who wrote the question and was going to go back. And it was an important question about care workers. Uh, right. Okay. So, uh, so this is a question uh, and care, care managers, and this is, uh, I know the person who wrote the question and she is a care manager. So care home managers are pressured by local adult social care. And have you come across this? Absolutely. The other side of the coin is that um, the registered person care managers have, have, have themselves been put under extreme pressure. They also are in fear for their jobs, just as the care workers were in fear for their jobs. Um, it, it's just it's, it's it's pushed up the whole tree. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a very difficult position in all the all, all the meetings that I've sat in no, all of the managers said we don't want to be doing this we don't want to be letting this person go but we 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 have to follow the regulations it's almost like they've got fear in their eyes they're being threatened with 50,000 pound fine for everybody who works unvaccinated so when I sit in a meeting and say you know you're staring down the barrel of an unfair dismissal claim for a year's salary let's say 30 grand they're probably thinking, OK, we'd rather pay 30 than 50 because that's what the CQC are going to fine us. Right. Yeah. OK. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amina. Right. I'm going to wrap up. And so before I do, I'm now going to. Um, uh, I'm going to have to save the chat because if anybody wants a copy of the chat notes, then they can email me. So before I wrap up, I'm going to end the um, video. And before I do that, I'm <laughs> so I'm, I'm not very uh, technical when it comes to. Um, all right, let me share the screen. So I'm thinking, thinking on my feet here. OK, that's good. So just to close off, because this is a, a recorded video that we're doing and uh, we've done the questions. And I'm going to go on to, okay, so so next session. So thank you guys for attending this Freedom Friday. The next session coming up is going to be the session that we do on the first Friday of every month. And this is where we do our spiritual empowerment, because obviously when we're empowering ourselves against this tyranny, um, it's our, it starts with ourselves. And uh, I share with you on the first Friday of every month uh, a chant that I do, which is called Nam Yo Harenge Ko. And this session, we talk about um, how we can transcend reality and create our future um, through the power of our own intention. And that's the that's that'll be the first. Oh, and uh, because it's the third of December, so we have a special Christmas theme for that one. Um, so tune in for that one. If you want to subscribe to Cat UK and um, get updates for the Zooms that we do, it's catuk.uk slash join us, join hyphen us. And uh, uh, we, we do have a donate. So if you go onto the website, kakuk.uk, um, there is a donate button on the top there as well. It's donorbox.org slash kakuk. And thank you very much. And see you next Friday. Don't forget to bring a friend. Um, and if you do want slides and resources, email me. Um, well, if you, or if you want a copy of the chat log for the, for the links that were shared, it's hello at kakuk.uk. And stop the share and I'm going to stop the video. Um, thanks, guys.